Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue to talk about health care, I also want to bring in investigative reporter Lee Fong of The Intercept. He recently wrote a piece headlined, Next Phase of Obamacare Repeal Will Target Mandate Requiring Prenatal Coverage, GOP Leader Tells Allies. The article begins, when Republican Congressman John Shimkus expressed outrage during a House committee hearing Wednesday about men having to purchase prenatal care and their health insurance, the video clip of which caught fire on social media as an example of misogyny and cluelessness, he wasn't going rogue. He was just getting ahead of party leaders who haven't publicly announced their next steps quite yet. This is Shimkus making the comment after being questioned by Democratic Congressman Michael Doyle. What mandate in the Obamacare bill does he take issue with? Certainly not with pre existing conditions or caps on benefits or letting your child stay on the policy to 26. So I'm curious, what is it we're mandating? Would the gentleman you, yield? Yeah, sure. What about men having to purchase prenatal care? What? I'm just. Every, well, every, is you, that not correct? I, I, reclaiming my time. And should they? That was Republican Congressman John Shimkus. We're joined right now by investigative reporter Lee Fong of The Intercept. Lee, explain. Hi, Amy. Thanks for having me. Um, Republicans have long argued that the Affordable Care Act's uh, consumer mandates, uh, for example, uh, in the Affordable Care Act, there's the uh, essential benefits package, this uh, rule that mandates that all health insurance uh, plans offer a basic basket of coverage items. Um, that includes prenatal care, pregnancy care, mental health, um, hospitalization, uh, ER, um, drugs and, and lab work. Um, that this uh, essential package is included in every health insurance plan so that when you go to the doctor and you're covered, um, your health insurance plan actually covers some of these basic needs that everyone uh, essentially has. Now, in the bill that we're looking at today, that the CBO scored yesterday, um, this is only phase one of the plan. Um, the bill that uh, Paul Ryan has proposed is essentially a budget plan. Um, it doesn't touch um, most of these consumer safeguards. It, it does kind of roll back um, some consumer safeguards for Medicaid, but for the larger healthcare market, um, for individuals and, and employer-based plans, there aren't many changes. Uh, and that's because um, this is a three-phase strategy. The first phase of the, of the strategy uh, relates to the bill that Paul Ryan is proposing. Th that's because um, what they're using is, is a strategy called reconciliation. For any bill that's proposed that uh, reduces the deficit, and the CBO score confirmed yesterday that the Paul Ryan plan does reduce the deficit by over $300 billion over 10 years, um, given that score, it allows this bill to pass with only 51 votes meaning that it can bypass a Senate uh, filibuster, and Republicans, as long as they can keep their caucus together, um, they can pass this without any Democrats and send it to the president's desk. But what's interesting here, and what we kind of revealed uh, using a uh, strategy call that we obtained, um, Republicans are saying we couldn't fit all the changes to Obamacare into this one phase one uh, strategy. Uh, but Later this year, after this bill passes, they will use executive action, um, use the, the powers of the Department of Health and Human Services to try to roll back a lot of the consumer safeguards, going after uh, the essential health benefits plan and, and other regulations. So with J Congressman John Shimkus complaining about um, paying for prenatal care, pregnancy care, um, he wasn't just kind of riffing. Um, he was actually potentially uh, showing his cards that Republicans do plan to go after these um, essential services, just not in this initial uh, phase of the repeal effort. Explain what ALEC has to do with this, the American Legislative Exchange Council. Well, The Intercept, along with uh, a contributor, uh, Nick Sergi, um, we obtained a, a strategy call on, on Thursday, uh, right after uh, the two main House committees that um, marked up this legislation. Republican leadership um, have gone out and tried to win conservative support for this legislation. So this conference call that we obtained was a conference call 
with um, state legislative leaders that are a part of the American Legislative Exchange Council. This is a conservative advocacy group that brings together state lawmakers and lobbyists to come up with policy solutions. Um, this is one of the, the few groups that has endorsed Paul Ryan's legislation. This is also a group that's funded by health insurance companies, uh, drug makers, and, pharma and pharmaceutical companies that has long lobbied um, against the Affordable Care Act. Um, and push for a lot of the proposals that you see in the Paul Ryan plan, um, particularly, particularly the block granting of Medicaid. Um, so this was a call, um, probably like many others, of the House Republican leadership in Congress calling state lawmakers to try to build support for their plan. You also wrote a piece, Lee, um, uh, which was uh, Paul Ryan fundraised with health insurance lobbying firm just before his PowerPoint. Explain. Yeah, that's right. You know, um, this bill has a lot of losers, um, folks that are going to lose coverage because of Medicaid being cut, um, elderly uh, individuals who will see, you know, their, their premiums skyrocketing under this plan. But, you know, as you mentioned earlier, it has a lot of winners, um, whether that's uh, the medical device industry, which was receiving a tax cut. All the Affordable Care Act um, taxes are either repealed or delayed or the sun tanning industry, they receive um, a big tax cut under the Republican proposal. But one of the biggest winners of this plan is the health insurance industry. And, you know, as we've been reporting, um, the, health, the big health insurance lobby um, met last week as this bill was moving quickly through Congress. Um, even on Thursday, uh, after the, the bills passed through uh, markup, um, Paul Ryan, of course, got a lot of media coverage because he had a long press conference and a PowerPoint presentation w when he was trying to sell this plan. But what we found out was that just prior to that press conference, uh, Paul Ryan was fundraising with a lobbying firm that represents the health insurance industry, um, $10,000 per person type event, uh, raising money for Paul Ryan's joint fundraising committee that he uses to elect. House Republicans. And all throughout the week, we've seen um, congressional Republicans meeting with health insurance companies. The Americans, American health insurance plans, that's the trade group for the biggest insurers, uh, they met with Washington and met with Kevin Brady, the Republican chairman of the Tax uh, Ways and Means Committee. Uh, and, and again, I just want to emphasize that insurance companies, in so many ways, are the big winners of the bill. They receive specialized tax cuts because the Affordable Care Act financed itself with a special uh, tax on the health insurance industry at large. Um, the Affordable Care Act had um, a limitation on tax deductions for health insurance CEOs and, and other executives. That gets rolled back, as, as, well the, as well as the other taxes. And as you were talking about earlier in the program, um, this uh, Republican proposal allows us a greater level of uh, age discrimination. So you're going to see elderly Americans paying um, more than $10,000 a year in higher premiums. Um, at the same time, uh, if you look at how that kind of affects the health insurance market, the Republican proposal encourages younger, healthier people uh, to enter the health insurance market. At the same time, they're pushing older, sicker Americans uh, out of the market. So that can stabilize costs and, and boost profits uh, for insurers. Uh, so if you, if you look uh, just down the line, whether it's the, the regulatory changes or the tax changes or even the, the conversion of the individual mandate, instead of the government collecting a fee when people go without health insurance, now health insurance companies can charge a surcharge of 30 percent on people's premiums if they lose health care and then try to uh, get health, health insurance again uh, from going uninsured. So health insurance companies are the big winners, and they're uh, not only lobbying, but they're providing a lot of campaign fundraising support for Republicans pushing this plan. Ali, you have written over the years a lot about single-payer Medicare for All. As we wrap up today, um, can you talk about why this isn't being raised at this point? Well, look, um, you know, for this Republican plan, we see kind of a division in industry. Medical device companies, health insurance companies support it. But um, hospitals and many doctors' groups oppose it uh, because of the Medicaid cuts. But, you know, for a big plan uh, like single-payer, uh, Medicare for all, uh, we've seen over the years, every time this type of proposal is brought up, that actually unifies the for-profit uh, healthcare industries in America, um, because they're trying to protect 
um, uh, a system that, uh, frankly, uh, benefits them. Look in Colorado just last year. There's a, a ballot proposal uh, to enact single payer in, in that state, and the healthcare industries at large unified to lobby against uh, that plan to fund the opposition, and it was crushed. So, you know, moving forward, we, we don't see many Democrats uh, proposing an alternative, whether it's the, you know, public option or Medicare for all type plan. Again, that's because uh, many of the big healthcare industries in America, they play both sides of the aisle. They provide a lot of money to Democrats as well. Lee, I want to thank you for being with us. Lee Fung, investigative journalist at The Intercept, covering the intersection of money and politics. And we're going to link to your articles at democracynow.org.